This episode of The Curbsiders is available for CME and mock credit through our partnership with the American College of Physicians. ACP members can go to acponline.org forward slash curbsiders and claim their free CME and mock credit. Thank you and enjoy the show. The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Everybody, we're back. Hola, Mateo. <laughs> Hi, Stuart. Thanks for Hi. joining us here. Uh, is Paul here? No. Yeah, actually, uh, this feels like some weird fever dream. I'm not really sure anymore. <laughs> so this is uh, this is an unusual recording for us because we're all in person, and that includes the great Dr. Molly Hoyblind. Oh, Molly's here. <laughs> yes, happy to be here. We are at ACP, and this, this episode's going to be all about HIP with the great Dr. Ted Parks. But before we get to that, Paul, why don't you give the audience a little, what do we do on the show? Great, great question, Matt. I wonder that myself many a time. This is the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use you expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Um, I just, I'm not, I'm not going to be shaming anyone this week. I'm too tired to do it. But, so don't skip past the beginning. It'll make you a worse person. So I'm really excited to bring this episode to the Curbsiders audience today about hip pain. I know we see a lot of musculoskeletal complaints in primary care and in the clinic, and um, Dr. Parks does a wonderful job really explaining how to uh, evaluate a patient with hip complaints, how to examine them in the office, and then treatments that we can provide as clinicians. And he's very, very clear, very straightforward, gives us an awesome eight-second hip exam that you can all check out on YouTube and on the Curbsiders website. Dr. Ted Parks is an orthopedic surgeon with a specialty in sports medicine, joint replacement, and reconstructive arthroscopy in Denver, Colorado at Western Orthopedics. He's been there since 1994. He attended Yale Medical School and then did residency training at UCLA and fellowship in sports medicine in Cincinnati, where he specialized in advanced arthroscopic knee and and shoulder reconstruction. In his career, he has served as team physician for high school, college, and professional sports teams. Currently, in addition to his practice at Western Orthopedics, he is a clinical professor at the University of Colorado Denver School of Medicine and has received the Outstanding Clinical Faculty Teaching Award for his teaching there. He's also an instructor for the American College of Physicians and has been chosen by 5280 Magazine as one of Denver's top docs 14 years in a row. In addition to being named one of U.S. News and World Report's best orthopedic surgeons multiple times, he has worked with McGraw-Hill Publishing since 2014 on a textbook on orthopedic surgery, which is called Practical Office Orthopedics, which we, we've talked about on a previous show and we talk about on this show. It's a great book, so you should check it out. Uh, we do not get paid for saying that. We just think it's awesome. Uh, it's very useful for primary care docs or just uh, we think probably people that are going into their clerkship or just residents trying to learn joint exam. So without further ado, we'll get to Stuart's wonderful, what I imagine is a wonderful pun. And I say that with no sarcasm. Actually, with lots of sarcasm. All right. Hey, Matt, what kind of music is absolutely contraindicated status post-hip arthroplasty? I, I'm afraid to even respond. Hip-hop. <laughs> okay. Is that an original? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. Feels like good. <laughs> Ted, thank you so much for coming back on the show. The The knee was one of our, our big episodes from 2018, so you're back today to do the hip. Absolutely. First question, though, we got to, just in case people didn't hear the knee, they should go back and listen, but why don't you tell them a one-liner and include some stuff about yourself outside the world of medicine? Yeah, sure. I Basically, I'm a 57-year-old mechanic who, by luck and circumstance, got a license to work on the best machine on the planet. <laughs> That's good. I, I like, like that. Uh... <laughs> So outside of medicine, we know you have some hobbies. 
uh, what's happening in car car world these yeah, days? Yeah, um, we were talking before the show that uh, I, I got this crazy idea once upon a time to design my own car with a huge piece of clay in the garage that occupied our garage for about a decade uh, while I shaped it into what I thought was a cool shape and then uh, pulled molds from that and made body panels from that. So I have a car that I drive every day that uh, is, is a unique design and uh, I really, really want to make an electric version of that. Uh, and so I'm trying to source some some batteries and motors and whatever I can do. Might have a thousand cell phones underneath this thing uh, to, to battery it. I don't know. That sounds like you might end up on some kind of a watch list as well. Yes. They're like, what is this guy? <laughs> I think I already am. I'm firmly on a couple watch lists already. It feels almost like a Darwin Award in the making. It's yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> I think I filled out the paperwork already for that. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Uh, what's what's one of the, your favorite things that you've come across this week at ACP? Is there any kind of themes that have been really interesting or people you've collaborated with or take yeah, home pearls? That's a good question. Now, lo- unlike all the other people on in the convention center right now, I don't go to anything. So I haven't been to any talks, not a single one. Uh, uh, but the thing that I've found interesting about the meeting is uh, the people that come to the talks, I've been giving these talks, uh, are really, really fantastic uh, in that they're just so hungry for information. And uh, I love to teach. That's probably why I'm doing this in the first place. And there's nothing more fun for a teacher than to have a student who's really interested in the information and doesn't blink for two hours while you're talking and asks great questions or even bad questions, but is engaged. And uh, I'm really always surprised at these meetings, how engaged the people who come to the talks are. And it's just a treat for a teacher. And as a follow up to that, what's your favorite advice as a teacher? Oh, you boy, know, I've got for, a lot of teachers. things. And, uh, you know, I get a resident for a whole month, so they get peppered with all these stupid sayings and things that I have. <laughs> and uh, probably my top three would be... Um, there's no such thing as a dumb question. And that's overused, but it's so true. And I remember as a student being so afraid to ask questions because I thought that my stupid question would reveal to everybody that I hadn't studied a lick. And I didn't study nearly as much as I should have. Uh, But I probably studied as much as everybody else. Nobody studies as much as they think they should have when you're a student, uh, especially in medicine, because the the stuff is so overwhelming. So uh, as a teacher, now I can appreciate that it doesn't offend me at all if you haven't prepared. Uh, but I really get turned on if you engage. So I, I don't mind if it's a dumb question, but the fact that you're asking a question means you you know care about what I'm saying. And, and so I would really encourage students, if I could go back and redo my educational career, I'd ask way more questions. Uh, the other thing I always tell them is, uh, by the yard, life is hard. By the inch, it's a cinch. Meaning that if you're facing a huge project that just overwhelms you and you can't even start, it's so daunting, chop it up into little pieces and keep chopping those pieces into pieces until the piece is doable. And when you can do the piece, do that piece and then do the next one and address the project like that and it'll get done. Uh, uh, otherwise, you just get overwhelmed and don't do anything. And then the last one, uh, see, I'm already boring you with these. No, no, it's like the good. residents. <laughs> um, the last one would be... Um, Hear and I forget, see and I remember, do and I understand. So I try to get them to do as much hands-on, like multi-sensory, tactile, everything I can, because it just sticks better the more senses you recruit to learn something. We are going to inch our way through the (laughs) hip today, (laughs) and then uh, you are going to do a hip exam on Stuart uh, at the end. I think that's, That's that's a way to go. Molly, do you want to do the case? Sure, yeah. Uh, We've got Miss Bones, a healthy 59-year-old woman. She's coming into her primary care provider complaining of some hip pain. She's been having groin and leg pain for the last several months, and it's been gradually getting worse, so it's starting to interfere with her activity, and she's pretty active. She usually likes to run and, and stay very active. So I guess to start off with, what um, what's important for an internist to know about hip anatomy? Just kind of a brief overview of the anatomy of the hip. Yeah, and we're lucky because the hip anatomy is much more simple than shoulder or knee. And uh, you can think of the hip as just a ball in a bowl-shaped socket. Uh, and if you stop there, you'd probably do fine. Um, you, uh, if you want to be fancy, you can add this little ring of gristle that's on the rim of the socket. That's called the labrum. And uh, then uh, you can add the, uh, a thing called the, the greater trochanter and the bursa of the greater trochanter. So um, the, uh, the hip 
is the ball, the proximal most end of the femur. And just south of that is this big bony bump that you can feel on anyone. You can feel it on yourself. It protrudes right about where the seam of your pants is on the side of your thigh, up by your hip. And that's the greater trochanter. Uh, and, and that can get into trouble uh, because of, I guess, another structure we should include, which is called the iliotibial band, which got its name because it originates on the ilium up at your belt line on your pelvis and goes down all the way across the knee joint to the tibia, way down there. And to get there, there, it has to go up and over the greater trochanter. And uh, it's a, a structure that, like a lot of structures, as we go through life, it loses its elasticity. And as it loses its elasticity, it rubs against things with more friction than it should. And it can rub against the trochanter and cause an inflamed, sort of fluid-filled, angry and sac called uh, trochanteric bursitis. Um, so that's enough anatomy, really. is That's probably more than enough to, to tackle what we're going to tackle. We, we need a low bar. I'm glad that we're keeping it simple <laughs> here. And so as this patient who's coming in with kind of hip, kind of groin pain, just in terms of your initial approach, how do you start breaking down how you think about it and, and where it's coming from and where to go next? Yeah, the thing I'll do uh, when I see any hip patient is I'll remember that almost all, maybe 90% of the patients that I'll see in an outpatient setting, so that excludes like a hip fracture in the emergency room or anything like that, but in an office setting, a hip patient is going to likely fall into one of three buckets. Uh, The first one is osteoarthritis. Uh, The second one is greater trochanteric bursitis. And the third one is not really a hip problem at all. It's uh, a lumbosacral back problem. And it's amazing to me how many people come in for uh, listing on their intake form that they have hip pain uh, when it's their back. And it makes sense because there's a lot of overlap between those two zones of discomfort. Uh, but if ever I hear that it's buttock, back of the thigh, especially if it goes below the knee, and one of the things in the description that Molly gave me that stuck out, uh, the, the description's classic for arthritis uh, in a lot of ways, and we'll go back and see why. But the one thing that stuck out is that she's having leg pain. And now anatomically, leg is from the knee to the ankle, thigh is from the knee to the hip. So I don't know if we're really talking about thigh pain. That goes along pretty well with hip arthritis. But if it's really leg pain, uh, that's a little fly in the ointment. And that's that's actually more realistic. I've never seen the patient who's exactly like the textbook textbook description. They always throw one zinger in there, like leg or uh, you know numbness that goes into my toes or something that just spoils the whole thing. <laughs> so it's uh, it's a pretty realistic uh, presentation actually. But all the other things absent that are pointing me toward the arthritis diagnosis. The age, right? Very unusual to get arthritis. Uh, as a young person, 20s, 30s, because arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis anyway, is sort of a wear and tear problem. Uh, Our cartilage surfaces are beautiful and they're designed to do great for about 50 years, which is about as long as we're designed to do great. And then uh, we're we're cheating the system and getting by a lot longer than that. But as we go past 50, those surfaces can wear down. She's 59. She's in an age group, a little on the young side, but definitely in the age group uh, for whom arthritis can be a problem. So the age matches. Uh, I think she said that she had had pain in the groin. Right. And uh, the three locations for hip pain, groin pain classic for the joint and the joint pathology that's the most common is uh, hip arthritis. Lateral sided hip pain, like we were talking about a second ago, right under the seam of your pants, that's more classic for greater trochanteric bursitis. And pain posteriorly in the buttock, especially if it goes down the thigh and especially if it goes below the knee, uh, that's more classic for a lumbosacral diagnosis. So she's matching so far the osteoarthritis in terms of her age, the location of her pain. Um, and honestly, I forgot some of the other things that are, are her uh, complaints. Uh, but uh, can you Those remind? were the main ones, mostly okay. that it's it's starting to interfere with her activity. And yeah. she's a pretty active woman. And Okay, that actually is a, an important piece of history too. So uh, I tell patients and residents that uh, the articular cartilage on the surface of the ball and it also lines the surface of the socket. This is the same stuff you see on the end of a chicken bone, okay? That white glistening stuff that my mom used to call gristle. We have that. Amazing stuff, very slick and slippery. Uh, when it's lubricated with synovial fluid, it's got a coefficient of friction 10 times better than an ice skate on ice and much better than anything we've been able to invent in industry to take its place. And it's also biologically phenomenal because it's one of the only tissues that's numb, has no sensation naturally. Uh, so this uh, material, this miraculous material is critical for normal function. And right underneath it is bone, which is about the worst bearing surface you can imagine. It's rough and abrasive and chocked full of tons of nerves. Uh, that material with use wears down. All of, all of us, every day, every minute we walk, we wear some finite, 
unmeasurably small but finite amount of material away. Uh, so uh, as you go through life uh, and that wears down, you get closer and closer to and maybe are unlucky enough to arrive at uh, exposed bone, you know, which quickly scrubs away the cartilage on the other side of the mm-hmm. joint. And then you've got uh, bone on bone arthritis. So is it kind of like wearing away a brake pad that yeah. one, one day you're good <laughs> yes. and then yeah. immediately you fall off? Yeah, there's often a right. precipitous drop off. Sometimes there isn't. And people always ask me, well, if it's numb and I still have like an eighth of an inch layer there, why am I having symptoms? And the reason is as it wears, it goes from smooth to rough. So even if you have some left, but it's not smooth and it's rough, it creates friction and joints hate friction and they respond to friction by making extra joint fluid. They think, okay, there's friction. I got to lubricate this better. So they turn on the pump and it's a big part of the pain of arthritis is extra fluid distending the capsule, putting pressure on the capsule that makes things sore and stiff. And it's probably why oral anti-inflammatory medicines and cortisone injections work. They're not working by applying material. That'd be really cool if they did. All they're doing is deflating inflamed capsules, and they're taking pressure off the capsule, which improves motion and decreases pain. Ted, I wanted to bring it back to the um, what you were saying earlier, because like last time with the knee, you gave us this bucket analogy. Yes. It's four buckets. I'm big on buckets. And so here it sounds like the 90% of people are going to fall into the three buckets you said was the spine, the osteoarthritis, or the trochanteric bursitis. Correct. And to be technically correct, now trochanteric bursitis is like an uncool term. Okay. Now the cool term is greater trochanteric pain syndrome. And the only reason it's changed is we appreciate now that some of the people with greater trochanteric bursitis have these insertional tendonitis of the gluteus muscles and other right there at the same spot pathology. We're still kind of figuring all that out. So I'm comfortable using greater trochanteric bursitis, but uh, we might, people are going to look down their nose at us. We want to sound cool. We need to be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. And so I was going to ask you there, you also mentioned, and we'll, I don't know how we'll have time to get to all of these, but what are some red flags that kind of might tip us? This is more one of the zebras, like the 10% that don't fall into those three buckets. Yeah, great question. The problem is there aren't any. Um, those uh, <laughs> those, those diagnoses for me are diagnoses of exclusion. If I have somebody who's just not making any sense, none of the stuff I'm doing is working and nothing's adding up and I'm totally confused chances are they're one of the zebras, the 10 percenters. And those are things like avascular necrosis of the femoral head uh, or a labral tear and or what's called femoral acetabular impingement, where the two bones, the, on the, one on the ball side and one on the socket side, actually impinge against each other. And they're not designed to do that, but in some uh, morphologic variants that people have, they do. And when they do, they can cause trouble. But the physical exam tests for that, the history questions for that, they're very vague. They're not very sensitive and they're not very specific. So they're not, uh, it's not like you can use those tools to yeah. jump on a hip patient and figure out that that's what they have. It's more like nothing else is making sense. And there's a great test to find them, which is an MRI arthrogram. Okay. And uh, so if you're stumped, do that. I've never can... ordered one of those. So they'll yeah. probably be seeing you at that point. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And that's perfectly appropriate. I think that that 90% of things, uh, primary care providers can tackle those no problem. And if it's a 10%er, maybe that is the time to, to go to an orthopedic specialist. I feel like that could go one of two ways. You would either look like a mad genius if an MRI <laughs> arthrogram comes from an internist, or uh-huh. you're just going to look like, what is this moron doing? Like, it's really, that's a, it's a tightrope to walk. Yeah, but we all, we all rock it, walk it and fall off on both sides all the time. I mean, I do, but just, just part of the art of medicine. It just happens that way. You know, nobody's 100% genius. So taking back to the case, so we've gotten this history from her and we're trying to decide, is this actually osteoarthritis or the trochanteric? Pain syndrome, greater uh-huh. trochanteric pain syndrome. You're really cool, Molly. Uh, yes, <laughs> awesome. Uh, or back pain. What kind of physical exam findings would you use to help differentiate between those? Yeah, so the physical exam for the hip is ridiculously simple. Uh, when I teach the residents, uh, it never fails. I'll have a resident, a new resident, and they'll I'll ask them to go examine the patient for hip pain. And 45 minutes later, I got to call security to get them out of the room because they're doing like all these tests that I've never even heard of, and uh, which is human nature. I mean, I do it too. If you're doing something you're unfamiliar with and you want to be a good scout and get everything right, you just try to be really, really, really thorough. And uh, the more comfortable you are with something, the more you can taper that down. Uh, And the physical exam for the hip, really, there's just two things you need to do. Uh, and, and we'll demonstrate them later. But one is this thing called the windshield wiper test, where you're really putting the hip in 90 degrees of flexion, 
You don't even have to put it there because the patient sitting on the exam table is already in that position. And then internally and externally rotating the femur. Uh, and there's a big old joystick to do that with called the leg. And I'll show you how to do that. It's so simple and it's so sensitive. That's a great test. And that test basically tests for and finds anything that's causing inflammation in the hip joint. So the hip joint is surrounded by this capsule, this membrane that holds fluid. We talked a second about how it gets uh, distended in arthritis. And if you have anything inside the joint that's inflaming the joint and overproducing joint fluid, the capsule's tense like a balloon that's ready to bust. And when you're in 90 degrees of flexion, you've already kinked that 90 degrees. And then by doing that maneuver, you're sort of wringing out the wash rag and putting a lot of tension on the capsule. And that causes the patient pain and you perceive it as a decreased range of motion. It's so, uh, it's so tense and under so much tension, the motion is abbreviated compared to the opposite side. And you've got a control right next to you on the other leg. So you compare the two and you'll be, I mean, it should be a marked, not like a head scratcher difference. It should be like, whoa, that's really different. Uh, and that's what an osteoarthritic hip will feel like. So that's the best screening test for osteoarthritis of the hip. The other thing I'll have them do is the patient will lie on their side with their affected side up and I'll press over the greater trochanter. And finding the greater trochanter is totally easy. I mean, it's, the, it's so prominent, even in the heaviest patients, you can find it easily. The only thing about that test that I have to warn you is that it's kind of like poking you in the eye. It's not unusual for it to hurt. So you have to flip them over and control by testing the other side. And it's only valid if it's a lot on one side and not much on the other side. Some people who are real sensitive to that kind of thing will have ridiculous pain, but then you flip them over and it's just as ridiculous on the other side. And then it becomes invalid. Uh, so that sounds ridiculously simple, which is it great. It is ridiculously simple. <laughs> I was also, Orthopedics is ridiculously okay. simple. <laughs> I was also taught to check like hip flexion range of motion. Is that not important? I think it's way less important. Okay. Uh, and th again, there are a zillion things you can check, but when it comes down to helping you make a diagnosis, I think those two things are head and shoulders above everything else. Molly, uh, how do you think we should proceed here? Do you want to go into the individual diagnoses next? Or do you want to um, kind of talk more broadly about treatment? What do you want to... Uh, well, I guess... We if, didn't really talk about x-rays either. Yeah, I, th I think maybe a quick quick mention of, of x-rays. Sure. So if you evaluate her and she does have limited range of motion or pain on the, the windshield wiper test, does she need imaging right away? Or do you go into conservative treatments? Or what's your next step? Yeah, I guess if you really, really want to make the diagnosis, uh, AP pelvis x-ray is the best. And we're so spoiled in our office because all I have to do is snap my fingers, it gets done, and it's on the computer screen in front of the patient. And the AP felt pelvis is a great one because it'll show their unaffected side and it'll show their affected side all in the same picture. And I can show them the space between the ball and the socket on the healthy side, all full of nice, healthy cartilage. And then I'll show them the other side where the two bones are touching each other. And it's a visual that you have you don't need any medical training to see that and totally understand what's going on. So I love doing that because it's so fun to see the light bulb go off over the patient's head. Uh, but technically speaking, I guess you don't have to do an x-ray. You could say, okay, the chances are excellent that this is uh, osteoarthritis based on the exam. And you could initiate uh, conservative treatment, uh, which would be things like oral anti-inflammatory medications. The, uh, physical therapy probably plays a role. And this was something that really confused me as a student because I had no concept of why taking two sensitive bones and rubbing them together more would ever make you feel better. Uh, but we think that what happens uh, with physical therapy is by stretching, you can increase the compliance and flexibility of the capsule, which gets stiff with arthritis. And the more uh, compliant that is, the better it will accommodate swelling without pain and stiffness. So uh, maybe that's how physical therapy works. The data are pretty clear that it does help. So I would start with that. Now, the problem with oral anti-inflammatory medications is it's great if you have a sprained ankle, use it for two weeks at high doses and then quit. And that's pretty safe. But these people, if they have osteoarthritis, let's say they have bone on bone arthritis, in two weeks, they're right where they were when they started. So this is lifetime and to get results, you have to use high doses. So we, you guys know better than I do that high doses of oral anti-inflammatory medications for long periods of time can cause all kinds of other problems with stomach lining and kidney function. So it probably is more conservative. This is going to sound ridiculous, but it's more conservative, less invasive to do a cortisone injection into the joint because there's no or little systemic effect uh, versus high-dose, long-term oral anti-inflammatory medications. So all the textbooks, all the teaching are start with oral anti-inflammatory medications. That's the least invasive. If that doesn't work, use a cortisone injection. But I've been teaching and I've been practicing the cortisone injection first 
because I think it's actually more conservative than starting with the oral anti-inflammatory medications for a permanent condition, a condition that's not going to uh, self-resolve. The, the steroid thing, every, you know, you read so much about the evidence for whether it's spine, whether it's knee or shoulder, yeah. it, and I, I know they're still being widely used. Do you, what is your thoughts about like the safety of those for joints um, and, the, and the long-term use, like people that are getting serial injections, um, is is the hip a unique condition that it, it might be better suited for than other joints? Or No, I don't think so. I think that uh, we're starting to just better understand a lot of these things. Uh, when I was trained, we were told that there's no systemic effect at all to an intraarticular injection. And we know that's not true. You know, patients with diabetes will often bump their blood sugar, demonstrating to us that some's getting systemic. So we thought, okay, actually there is a little systemic effect. And now, uh, and then it went to there's zero like harm to giving these injections as long as you space them out. We learned in athletes, if we give them willy-nilly often, they can soften connective tissue and accelerate wear rates inside the joints. Uh, and we've taught each other that if we wait four months or longer, and some people even say three months, uh, it's totally safe to repeat them. And now we're learning that even a single cortisone injection may have some softening effect on articular cartilage and weakening effect on soft tissue structures. So, uh, and it totally makes sense. I don't think there's a single tool in my toolbox, surgery or medicine, that has zero downside. Uh, but like everything else in medicine and in life, you weigh the pluses and the minuses. And, uh, you know, that the minus on a, on a cortisone injection, especially if it's used judiciously every four months, is pretty small. Not zero, like we used to say it was, but real, real small. And uh, I think that it's unusual for me to have somebody who's getting those injections for years and years and years, only because what happens in this uh, break slash break drum or uh, uh, break analogy, or I always use the the treads on your tire analogy, that uh, eventually it gets worn out enough that the shots don't work. So I've, it's rare for me to do these for a real long time because they quit working after a while and then we have to go to the next step. But there's, uh, let's say it goes for a couple years. Uh, that's okay. And uh, the, uh, the technology, just like cell phones and computers, our joint replacement technology advances. So there is value to waiting. Uh, and uh, so like everything else, it's a balance of pluses and minuses. But I think the minus in terms of the danger of a cortisone injection is small. And there is a potential uh, plus in terms of technology getting better. And, and uh, the offer, operation I can offer you a year, two years, five years down the road is better than the one I have today. What about for the hyaluronic acid injections? What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Well, uh, the visco supplementation, I think, is is how a lot of people can, uh, sort of categorize those, right. and uh, they're not FDA approved for the hip. So, uh, in our practice, that's a non-starter. Uh, but you can use them off label in the hip, and their results, you know, their results in the knee are pretty mediocre. Uh, in fact, a lot of evidence uh, that they don't work really at all in the knee. Uh, at least uh, the the problem with all the evidence is. Uh, they'll, the evidence shows that they don't work better than saline. Uh, and the, the thing that's confusing is a saline injection actually works darn well. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, they probably are effective. They're just not more effective than saline. And, uh, you know, I'm surprised we're Which not much all, cheaper. <laughs> it's super cheap and it's super safe. It's probably the safest of all, you know. So why aren't we injecting more of these joints with saline? And maybe we will. Maybe that'll be the next big thing. Uh, that we would, be, find a that would be unreal if that if it was just like, we should have been injecting right. saline I, all this entire time. I, if yeah. you look at some of these data, it's amazing how well saline does. Saline kicks butt. It's, Placebo it, is strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so anyway, to your question, uh, because it's not FDA approved, I personally don't use it. But people are using it. And uh, results are just as mediocre as they are with a knee. And is this a technically difficult thing to do? I feel like it's not unusual in my yes. situation for people to go to IR for yeah. it rather than... Yeah, I think it's maybe even impossible to do well without imaging um, because uh, the landmarks are just not that predictive of what where the target is. And the target's small. Uh, in the knee, it's literally like trying to push a needle through your cheek into the inside of your mouth. The only error you can make is not going far enough. Uh, but here... You've got to uh, you've got to get into the capsule, which is about the size of uh, maybe a plum. You know that's small. So uh, I, I I don't think anybody can do it reliably without either ultrasound, and a lot of offices have in office ultrasound, or we have uh, just plain X ray. We don't have a fluoroscope, but you can do it with plain X ray, a fluoroscope, or ultrasound, and be very good at doing it. Without it, I just don't think it's uh, you can do it reliably well. 
I want to make sure we leave time to do both the video and get to the other diagnosis. Sure. So I think we should just say, at what point should we be sending people to you for a surgical referral for OA of the hip? Yeah, I think it's when you and the patient feel like you've exhausted the non-surgical stuff. Now, that's a vague answer, and it'll vary from person to person. Some people are hot to trot. I'm not going to do that. I'm like, I want to get this fixed. Uh, other people are more patient, uh, and they'll put up with the, uh, the, the non-surgical treatment. Uh, honestly, if you have bone-on-bone arthritis, you are looking at a hip replacement unless you get hit by a bus next year or something like that. So, so really, what we can offer them is we can offer them a deferral of surgery. And uh, there's, like we said, there's value to that because things improve over time. So I think yeah. that's really a good thing to do is to defer surgery if you can. One, one thing that I heard, may, whether or not you agree with this, I, when you're referring people for like, this was used for the knee, and I wonder if the hip, it, it follows, you don't want the patient to be so deconditioned and sedentary by the time you send them that they're not in any kind of shape to go through a surgery. So maybe that's one of the, like, yeah, they, you don't want them sitting on a couch for two years before we send them to you. Is that, is that uh, true or is it? You know, I wouldn't worry too much about that. The, um, okay. uh, the, by definition, the joint replacement patients are old uh, deconditioned. It doesn't happen to young people. So we're used to people with hypertension, diabetes, heart disease. Unless uh, you're like Hulk Hogan or something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's right. You yeah. see the body. They yes. Have hips. Yes. Those, those are good customers too. Uh, but, uh, but most people are going to be in that age group where they have three or four medical problems, some kind of serious, and they're older and they are deconditioned. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that those things weigh into that plus minus analysis, but not very heavily. So I wouldn't let that... Uh, swayed my decision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking to patients about hip replacements, do you try to have them wait, you know, as long as they can? Or are, are our current technology good enough that we can feel confident that the hip will last throughout the rest of their lifetime? Uh, both. The current technology is good enough, but it'll be better. So, uh, you know, we can tell people with pretty good confidence that if you're 60 or over, a hip replacement will last your lifetime. Uh, and, uh, if you're under between 50 and 60, it's likely not going to last your lifetime and is going to need to be revised, but we can get you through your life with a couple revisions. And if you're under 50, the statistics are daunting. You may become unrevisable after a couple of revisions. So we really, really try not to do the operation on somebody under 50. Um, it's a shame that the prosthesis, well, some of the prosthesis companies have looked at the statement that we can, in a 60-year-old, have your replacement last your lifetime. And they are advertising that joint replacements last your lifetime. And so a 30-year-old with a horrible hip comes to my office expecting a hip replacement and expecting it to last their lifetime. But this isn't true. Now, it might be in the future. We might be able to figure out how to, how to do that. But right now, we can't do that. So uh, I think that uh, we have a great operation a fantastic operation if you're 60 or over, high patient satisfaction scores, low complication rates, some of the best of both you know, for all operations. Uh, but it still isn't uh, reliable enough to offer somebody below 50 and promise them it'll last their lifetime. I think we should talk uh, to, about trochanteric bursitis or one of the others, and then we can at the end we can just do some random follow-up questions if we have other things. Sure. Okay, so if, if this patient... We're taking her back, and instead on the physical, she has a normal range of motion but has some tenderness over her greater trochanter. Um, so we're diagnosing her with greater trochanteric pain syndrome. What, what kind of approach do you take at that point? Okay. So uh, the, uh, the problem here is the iliotibial band. We talked about that just a second ago, this strap about the size of a belt that goes from your belt line across down the side of your thigh, just about where the seam on your pants is, all the way below the knee. It gets tight. And it has to rub on the trochanter, and it goes back and forth over the trochanter every step you take. So if it's tight, it's just rubbing against there and creating this sort of, it's almost like a blister on your foot when you rub on it too much. It's a fluid-filled, angry, inflamed little sac we call greater trochanteric bursitis. And uh, the root of the problem is the loss of elasticity of the iliotibial band, uh, at least we think uh, in most cases. So the, the this treatment design should be have an element of IT band stretching in it. And there's a really, uh, maybe one of the things we can show on the physical exam is the IT band stretch. You can send someone to physical therapy, uh, perfectly valid, or they can do it themselves. And a lot of people who don't want to pony up the, the copay, that's a barrier to completing physical therapy. So I'll show them the, the, uh, the uh, stretch. It's easy to do on your own. And I'll definitely offer them physical therapy, but they can do the stretch on their own if they like. Uh, that's sort of the most conservative thing is just do the stretch. 
uh, see how it goes and come back if it's not better. Uh, if they want to be more aggressive, or let's say they do come back after the stretch doesn't work, then a cortisone shot right on the greater trochanter helps a ton. We don't have good, reliable surgical solutions for this. And all the surgical solutions that we've tried, uh, we cut into the greater trochanter just to kind of expose the area. And whenever you cut something, it gets scar tissue and scar tissue is less elastic. So we do a better job at making people worse with this surgery than we do at making them better. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I I thought I was going to say something funny and uh, then nothing came to mind. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty funny. Actually, what I was remembering when we, I used to do a fair amount of a greater trochanteric bursitis injections or bursa injections. Uh-huh. I gotta, I gotta get, get on saying the, the cooler terminology that you're Yeah. You're yeah. I'm having a hard here. time adapting that to <laughs> so adopting that. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, get with the times, nerd. All right. <laughs> um, it, it seems like it's a pretty big target and this for primary care docs, I feel like that's something they can be pretty easily trained. Absolutely. Up on. on the scale of uh, degree of difficulty, it's the lowest one of all the injections in muscular yeah. Skeletal care. Okay. It's like a 0.5. It is. And in, in, it's funny. I don't want to plug the book too much, but I do want to plug it a lot. Yeah. We uh, should, but there's an injection it. chapter back here, and each of the injections is rated on degree of difficulty. And the like starter one, if you're nervous about giving injections, greater trochanter. It's like that. Right. You can't miss. It's just so easy. I think uh, that's Stuart's cue to see how many copies are left on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> 17 left. And it's uh, $73.90. Okay. There, thank you. <laughs> And I get like a dollar seventy five for everyone that sells. So buy a lot of them, guys. Buy like he ten needs, each. He needs money for the lawsuit that the U.S. government or uh, Tesla, Not to mention Tesla, Tesla yeah. Is, yeah, is levying against him for his electric car. Exactly. Uh, well, I think we covered kind of those three big buckets. Um, and the lumbar spine thing. I did. I did have a question. This yeah. was, uh, I was. Te- I was telling them about a, a challenging patient I saw. Early in my career, she was very frustrated with me because I felt she had both lumbar spine, uh, she had pain going down the back of her leg, but she Uh was also complaining of like groin pain and had some osteoarthritis on x-ray. And I found it really difficult to separate the two out and figure out like, which one do I go after first? And Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any wisdom as to how you handle well, that Well, I have that an approach. I don't know if it's a wisdom approach, but, uh, but the reason I have an approach is it's very common for those two things to come together. And they overlap so much, it's impossible to be 100% certain how much is coming from the spine, how much is coming from the hip. Okay. Um, the, uh, when I talk to patients about this, I take my ballpoint pen apart and I use the little spring. And I say, you know, this is what happens when you bend over. And it, the, the motion is actually distributed through the spine and the hip. And then I take the little uh, ink uh, cylinder and stick it halfway up and bend it again. I say, if one part's stiff, the other part works twice as hard. So if you have a stiff hip from arthritis, you'll quickly wear out your back. If you have a stiff back, you'll put more mileage on your hip. So really common together. So uh, if I'm really stumped, I'll try a cortisone injection into the hip. Okay. And whatever amount of the pain goes away with that uh, might predict how much the what proportion is coming from the hip, and if we're still stumped, I'll and we're getting to where we're looking at something like surgery. I'll just talk to the patient about the fact that uh, these two operations, back surgery and hip surgery, are on the opposite end of the patient satisfaction spectrum. And if we're going to choose one, the hip for sure is the winner. It'd be way better and more likely we're going to help you with a hip replacement if it's a fifty-fifty than a back operation. So, uh, so uh, we usually, if we get to that point, we'll do the hip with the understanding that if it doesn't make the patient satisfied, we might have to go back and do something with the back. What, what sort of things are you doing for the back, the back part of that equation? Is it, are you, is it physical therapy, NSAIDs, if they can take them? Uh, yeah, all it's, it's of all of that stuff. Okay. And uh, if for me, the reason I don't uh, in my practice do any back stuff other than the accidental hip patient that has back is that uh, it's, I, I just have, I don't think we've figured that one out very well. Uh, our you, treatments aren't that satisfying. At least I don't think, I'm not a yeah. back specialist. My back colleagues will cringe when they hear this, uh-huh. but, uh, but I think everybody will admit that our success isn't as good uh, as it is for other joints like the hip. Yeah. I think it's tough. We we talked about way back when the yellow flags, there's a lot of like poor predictors, like patients coming to you with chronic pain from mm-hmm. the back that it's it's tough to like, you know, figure out what's what and what's, yeah. what's organic, what's not organic. Yes. And I think even when we figure it out, our treatment just falls short so often. It's our medication management's a mess. It's, yeah. You can't use Tylenol and says are restricted in half our patients. Opioids right. are an obvious problem. Gabapentin is garbage. Like what are we, right. what are we yes. even doing? So it's, it's just- It's frustrating it's, for the it's patient and for us. Yeah. It's really yeah. a challenge. 
Okay, time to bring it home, uh, Molly. What yeah. else are we? What I, else are we I missing? I think here? that was good. Uh, uh, one thing that that I thought was really interesting from your chapter was kind of uh, the the materials that go into the hip replacement mm-hmm. and how that affects their long term outcomes. Yes. So maybe if we could just spend a quick minute, um, sort of going over the evolution of that and, and yeah. why hips fail when they do. Yeah, it's it's really challenging for us, and it really is uh, where we realize that the man made device that we put in each other as humans is way falls way short of what nature had in there originally. And uh, our challenge or one of our challenges now is uh, bearing surfaces and trying to choose or invent bearing surfaces that when they articulate, don't generate wear debris particles. And currently we're using polyethylene socket liners and those polyethylene socket liners do generate particles. And the particles they generate happen to be unfortunately about the same size and shape as bacteria. And and you mount an immune response to them. And uh, there are all kinds of electromicrographs of, of uh, phagocytes with pieces of polyethylene inside them. Fantastic. And uh, it's, uh, and there's so that kind of a response happens if you get uh, a cold or anytime there's like an illness, your body attacks it, the battle's over, you win, move on. But this is something that every single day, these, this process is happening. Particles are generated a battle against particles, enzymes and things are generated. And that makes the hip sort of chronically ill, uh, this constant exposure to particles. And the illness manifests sometimes in a softening of the bone around the device, which leads to component loosening. And component loosening is the number one cause of joint replacement failure. The bond between the part and the bone fails, sort of like putting a cap on a tooth and it comes off one day. And that happens in hip replacements and knee replacements. That's the most common way for them to fail. And uh, patients a decade, two decades, three decades later, they come to us and they say, this thing's starting to hurt. And it's hurting because the piece isn't bonded anymore and it's moving when they walk. So it's chafing against the bone. And what we see on x-ray is a lucency between the part in the bone, meaning that it's moving. Just like a fence post in sand, as it wobbles, it creates a void around itself. And we see that on x-ray and it moves enough that it hurts the patient. So uh, we've, we've tried really hard to come up with novel bearing surfaces that don't generate particles. Uh, and we've, we've messed up big time with a metal on metal design that was popular in about 2000. And by 2007, it was uh, illegal basically and class action lawsuits because it didn't generate any plastic particles. That was true, but it generated particles of metal that were toxic in many patients locally and even systemically in terms of neurotoxicity, kidney toxicity, uh, myocarditis of the heart muscle. So it was really a bad, bad chapter for us. Uh, we have ceramic on ceramic bearings, but they can squeak or break. Uh, so we're still trying to figure this out. And uh, a good bearing surface that works well, low friction, durable, but doesn't generate particles, that's our holy grail for that. Uh, the, the book chapter has some other great stuff in there about the blood supply that we I know we don't have time to get into because I want to spend the rest of our time on the, the hip exam video. Yeah. Um, so people people should definitely check that out. It's like it's a great way to uh, to learn the hip. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks yeah. a lot. I appreciate that. So uh, any like if you had to pick one take home point for the hip that you wanted the audience to absolutely remember, do you have yeah. it uh, putting you on the spot there? Uh, I guess the take home pick, and it's true of almost everything in orthopedics. It's way simpler than you think it is. Don't be intimidated by it. Uh, you can handle it for sure. Uh, with uh, with uh, basic, it's a very simple, straightforward training. All right, thank you. Uh huh. Thank you. That was great. Yeah, you bet. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. That may have been the worst one. <laughs> Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. We are committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate and review the show show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to Nora Toronto for writing the script with us and to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Dr. Molly Hoyblein. I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And Stuart, before you go, I wanted to thank Dr. Christopher Chu for his amazing videography skills on you this You have his episode. name wrong. Chris the Chew Man Chew. I was corrected. And I've been Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham. And good night. This was a nicely tight episode. <laughs>
Until the end. Until the end. Hey everybody, we're back. Well, uh, hi Matt. Let's just wait. get let's get through this intro. Sounds we got good. <laughs> we gotta get through it, Stuart. <laughs> now you have nothing to say for the first time ever. No, I thought you were gonna restart it or something. No, okay. Just I, I might restart it now. <laughs>